No, thank you guys so much for uh, introducing yourself and sharing a little bit about what you're interested in. It really fuels me up to to hear where people are coming from and where their interests lie. And uh, the park system was created by volunteers and continues to rely on them. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for sharing. So right now, can everyone see the screen right now, the slides? Okay, sure. That's yes. great. Yes. Yeah. Welcome you guys for today's new volunteer orientation. And uh, so, uh, thank you. And uh, so first of all, uh, our stewards uh, is a non-for-profit organization provide uh, environmental education, interpretation, and stewardship uh, for the Russian River area. And uh, we are also a cooperating association for the California State Parks. So right now we have uh, 10 to 15 member in our board and our executive director is adjusting. And uh, we have uh, around nine full-time and part-time staff. And we have around uh, 500 members till now and uh, around uh, 300 volunteers and uh, also uh, 1,500 supporters. And this is uh, our photo of the all staff members. And we serve uh, three state parks around this area. And uh, the first one is the Armstrong Redwoods State uh, Natural Reserve. And uh, the second one is the Austin Creek State uh, Recreation Area. And currently it's closed, uh, but it will open in the future. And the third one is the Sonoma Coast State Park. Uh, which include uh, Willow Creek watershed. So the area is uh, from Jenner to the Duncan Mills. So it's a huge area and uh, it includes a series of beaches along the Sonoma coast. And then I'm going to turn to Amelia to talk about the volunteers in parks program. So uh, do you want to share your screen, Amelia, or? Have you talked about um, the intro part? I already kind of give, gave my bit yeah. about the volunteers in parks program. Yeah, uh, get it. But I do have more to share at the end of the meeting. Okay, sure. Yeah. Thank you, Amelia. Okay, then uh, for today's training, we just want to show you our volunteer opportunities in our parks and also to walk you through all of the paperwork, all of the new volunteer orientation, you know, packet, how to finish all of the paperwork and how to help you get in on board. So first of all, we have many uh, volunteer opportunities this year. And uh, this is a list in the Armstrong Redwoods. Currently we have uh, three volunteer programs and uh, so these are three, if you want to uh, check them, uh, we have listed them on the California State Parks, um, you know, this webpage. If I click this. Yeah. Uh, you can see all of the three volunteer opportunities on the California State Parks website. And this is uh, about Armstrong Redwoods. And uh, then uh, the Sonoma Coast State Park. So we have a long list of uh, volunteer positions here. And uh, it's the same if you want to see it in the California State Parks webpage, uh, there is also a uh, website link. I can share this in the chat box. It, it's on the stewards webpage. Yeah, exactly. We have a new um, web page, Norma. We made it on the um, parks.ca.gov site. So it's mm -hmm. easily accessible from the Sonoma Coast State Park web page. If you go mm -hmm. to that park site, there's a mm -hmm. little link on the side that will say volunteer opportunities. And it's easily yeah. shared with our people. Exactly. Okay, let's go back to the... Let's see. 
And uh, then uh, I'm going to turn it over to Alex Wieselo, who is a State Park Peace Officer. Uh, he can't be here today, but he recorded a radio, uh, video uh, in January. And uh, his topic is about uh, speaking with the public. So we are going to see this video. Okay. Morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Can everyone see the screen? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So, um, my name is Alex Leslo, one of the state park peace officers in Sonoma Mendocino uh, Coast District. I am actually up in Mendocino County, but this is a presentation I put together either for our volunteers up here, and we thought it'd be good for you guys as well. Um, we're just going to go over quickly 10 minutes of speaking with the public. Um, nothing too intense, just some things to think about when you guys talk with people. Uh, first off, every time you're talking to someone, it's a first contact, right? It doesn't matter if you talk to them before or not. So we always want to start our interactions with a uh, nice warm greeting. You guys are the awesome face of State Park. So something like, hi, my name is Alex Wessel. How are you? Um, you guys want to use howdy. That's totally fine. Um, you can do things like, oh, I noticed you were looking at uh, a new drone sign. Would you like to learn more? Uh, with our volunteers, you guys are really there to help educate the public. Um, you guys provide that interface with them so they can learn more about the awesome parks they're in. Um, so we can talk about things like the awesome biodiversity in Armstrong Redwoods or um, Sonoma Coast State Park, the uh, seal, seals out there. You can have talked about why it's protected. Um, and you can also think about what options you have for things that are going on. For example, let's say you're seeing some of their dog off leash. It's pretty common, right? You're going to say, hi, my name is Alex. I'm a volunteer with State Parks. Uh, I'm just going out and talking to you guys about dogs. Um, just want to let you know, dogs are allowed on leash in, you know, campgrounds, on beaches. You just give them the education, the opportunity to learn about it. One of the really important things when you talk to someone is phrasing. So uh, what our goal is, is whenever we're talking to someone who's want to use I words instead of you, it changes how they feel about what you're saying. If I say, you have your dog off leash, you are breaking the rule, they're going to think I'm accusing them, and that's not necessarily our goal. We want to do things that say, put us in charge, so it's, I notice there's a dog here. My understanding is X about the rules. And I, I know it's a little thing, but I, in my job, I find using I instead of you on any contacts really helps change how people feel about the contact. It can make it a lot easier to talk to somebody. Um, of course, there's still gonna be times people are a little more confrontational, but it can smooth some things over. Uh, one of the great books that uh, us peace officers like is Verbal Judo, General Art of Persuasion. It's a short read. Uh, I recommend everyone just look over it if you guys can. Um, some of the phrases that you want to think about avoiding are saying like, come here, you would understand because those are the rules. Uh, tell someone to calm down, never works. Don't do it. Um, I'm doing this for your own good and why don't you be reasonable? Those are things we just don't want to really have in our vocabulary. And then uh, the way we say things can save how our contact's going. You know, if we think about when someone's been talking to us in the past, um, they might say something that makes sense, but you might have been really mad about it. You know, maybe it's uh, you got pulled over for a traffic ticket and the, uh, the cop goes, do you know what you did? It's going to make you a little mad, right? So the way you say something can make a big difference on how someone's receiving the information you're giving them. Now, one of the really important things for us at State Parks is that you guys are an awesome resource. We want your place to be safe at all times, okay? So your job is not to enforce the rules, it's to help educate, right? And so it's important to know when to break away from a contact and just walk away. So if someone's breaking a rule, you probably inform them of the rule. You can tell them why it exists. Um, we don't want you guys saying, uh, they have to leave right away. I'm going to call a ranger. You're going to be in trouble. Those phrases 
can lead to a higher confrontation, you can be still call a ranger, right? That's what we want. But we don't want you to tell them, I'm going to call a ranger on you. Um, it's going to lead to more arguments while you're talking with them. And then as soon as someone pushes back, you guys' safety is important. Take a step back, don't take it personally, just walk away, right? We want you guys to give us a call and, you know, if it's an issue, we'll come deal with it. So if you see a big violation, you guys can call NORCOM. That's the number there. I'm sure Student Redwoods, uh, Coast Redwoods will provide it for all their volunteers. Uh, it's important you guys give name, location, the violation, and the phone number of who's calling um, so that we can call to get more details, know exactly where we're going, and know what we're looking for. That's it. Really short presentation for you guys. If you have any questions. Uh, Thank you, Alex, for uh, joining us. <laughs> um, I'm going to go, I'm going to stop um, sharing my screen. Um, interacting with the public is super important. Uh, glad that we're able to use this video to, to help with that. And um, go ahead, Alex. Mm -hmm. Alex, you can go ahead and share your screen. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Justin, for playing the video. Okay, and uh, thank you, Alex's presentation about speaking to the public. And uh, now we have uh, short presentations that uh, basically an overview of our various uh, volunteer programs. So uh, people presenting here are those people we are going to connect you with. And uh, please reach out to them if you are interested in these programs and uh, want to learn more information. So the first one is about the Armstrong Visitor Center. I'm going to hand over to Carol. Okay, hi. Uh, I've been uh, with the um, with the stewards for 20 plus years, but I really enjoy my time at the visitor center because I get to talk to people and find out what they're where they're from, what they are interested in. And then I let them know the different hikes or walks that they can take. And uh, of course, if they have a pet with them, what the rules are, but that's usually not a problem. Um, uh, it's fun to uh, talk with people. And the little ones, uh, we have the uh, little uh, children's treasure maps, and sometimes I give them out to adults who've never been here before so that they can learn on their own some of the new stuff um, about the uh, forest. And I also like to uh, give them a little background about the fire that we've had. Um, it used to be, because somebody would say, when was the last fire? And it used to be 1926, but now, unfortunately, mm -hmm. it's 2020. Anyway, it is fun to uh, work at the VC and uh, the nature store. It, uh, we, we make a lot of money. <laughs> That's one of the things we're there for. Um, and it's money for the park and for the stewards. So it's something that I appreciate uh, giving back to the uh, Armstrong Redwoods. Um, uh, let's see, what else? It's fun. I only do it once a week, but um, usually uh, Wednesday afternoons, my thing. And I have also done some other uh, volunteering for when we've had um, well, I, I actually started with uh, Whale Watch and then uh, came to Armstrong, but I've done the um, Art, Wine and Seafood Festival and I've done our September um, uh, festival in the, uh, in the theater. And that's always fun too. I, I just do it because it's fun to meet people and to hawk with them. And um, I hope people can join us. It saddens me when I see that we don't have a volunteer for the day before or 
after um, my my job. I can only do one day a week, but you know that's that's what it is. Um, I've learned a lot about people and about the the forest because people ask me questions and I look them up and I say, oh yeah, well look at this. Um, so it's fun and uh, entertaining. <laughs> that's the same thing. So I guess that's it, basically. Yeah, thank you, Carol. So yeah, other than the uh, uh, Armstrong Visitor Center, we also have a Jenner Visitor Center. So uh, the leader is uh, Linda Fisher. So it's a beautiful location. And if you guys are interested in working there, and uh, I can help you to connect with um, Linda Fisher and other uh, program managers around this program. So, and uh, next uh, we have uh, Mike Roa. So is Mike here? I'm not, I'm not sure Mike is with us right now. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to do an overview of Armstrong Redwoods Distance and Roving Distance if you want to do the watershed program, Alex. Yeah, sure. Yeah, great. Um, so we have a robust uh, docent program for Armstrong Redwoods. Um, folks will lead groups of people, uh, school children, adults, um, various uh, interested groups that we get from all over the place on basically a guided walk through Armstrong Redwoods. Um, we have a, a docent training uh, to help build folks' confidence and knowledge base. Um, there's also a, a manual that's helpful. Uh, the best way to get started in the Armstrong Redwood docent program and you know, sharing your passion and interest for nature in the park um, is to join in shadow. Um, we do a, a lot of tours in the spring and the fall with students. I think we had um, close to a couple thousand kids come through the park just this spring since we've reopened and restarted these docent tours. And there's the there's the formal tours that people will reserve through stewards and we'll link them up with various docent groups. Um, and then there's roving docents. So there's the scheduled group tours and then there's um, roving docents that you know, on their schedule, um, come join us in the park, uh, put on a vest, um, and either walk around the trails or uh, find sort of a station. We have a couple folks that like to hang out by the theater and the Colonel Armstrong tree um, and just be a public resource of information. And if people have questions about um, the park, uh, I know that we have a couple docents um, Red, Armstrong Redwood Docents on the call, if anyone would like to share more, um, great. Otherwise, we will announce and follow up with an email to this meeting that we're hosting a docent training on August 26th for Armstrong Redwood Docents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Justin. And the next is our Watershed Education Program. So we yearly have this watershed education program uh, around the, the Willow Creek watershed. So it's uh, close to the Pomo Canyon environmental campground. So we have some uh, water quality tests, macroinvertebrates, erosions. So we yearly have three stations there and we lead school children to get there to have field trips during uh, spring, during spring and fall semesters. So this is our watershed uh, education program. And uh, the program coordinator uh, is Mike Roa, and also there are uh, three other uh, volunteers currently. Yeah, this is uh, a page about the roving docents. So it's really flexible. You can choose uh, whenever you want to come here, and then you can log your hours at the visitor center. Then it's a uh, tide pool education. I'm going to hand over to Hollis. 
All right, well, we have um, three different ways that you can participate in tide pool education. Um, the first is we lead field trips into the tide pools. We lead classrooms into the tide pools. This takes place during the spring uh, when we have uh, morning low tides. Uh, we had to take a two-year hiatus because of COVID, but got that going in full swing this last spring. And in fact, we already have four field trips scheduled for next May already. Um, so this is something, if you're interested in doing it, it's a lot of fun, and uh, we'll be getting started again probably in March of next year. Um, we're really interested in um, having more roving docents, and roving docents spend a couple of hours at a beach of their choice during low tide, and they assist the public in um, how to explore the intertidal area safely, both with their safety in mind, you know, with ocean safety, and also the well-being of the animals that live there, because it's a very challenging environment for them. And um, if you're interested in that, please let me know, because we would like to get some people out there. We've had a lot of increase in visit visitation at the coast um, since the pandemic hit, and with it, there have been a lot of concerns about damage due to um, trampling and um, you know, pulling animals off of rocks and um, exploring them inappropriately. Uh, we also have a wonderful tide pool touch table that was built for us by the Bodega Marine Lab. And in fact, it's going to be showcased at the end of August. I think it's August 27th and 28th at the Bodega Seafood Art and Wine Festival. And this gives... Um, kids and their families an opportunity to see and handle and touch tide pool animals without the need for a um, low tide and you don't have to be next to the ocean. So that's a lot of fun as well. Um, seabird monitoring, is there a slide for that? Yeah. Oh, well, there's a touch table. <laughs> there's a okay. touch table in action. I'm going back to the... Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Okay, so we have a seabird monitoring program, and we currently monitor three sites off of the Sonoma Coast. They, um, those rocks house breeding seabirds, and um, they're raising their families. It's kind of funny because a lot of the birding books say that the area around the Sonoma Coast and Bodega Bay are dead for bird watching in the summertime. It's because um, they have migration a lot of birds coming through in the spring and the fall and, and overwintering, but it's really the most interesting time because these uh, birds that remain are doing job one, and of course that's raising their families. Um, we have... Um, Alice put up the bird one. Alice, we, yeah, okay, um, back, back, back one to back. seabirds. You're on pin and pen. Back one to seabirds. Okay, there we go. Um, you don't have to have a lot of experience um, with either birding or even with recognizing one cormorant from the other because it's a mentorship program. You work with experienced volunteers. Um, they, um, as, as Bob can tell you, um, you're, you're not left out there on your own. The other thing that we do is... Um, like if you're working on Bodega Head, there are a lot of visitors there. And so it's a great opportunity to do interpretation and uh, public education on what these birds are doing. It's of particular interest the last couple of years because Bodega Rock out in Bodega Bay is the new site of a brand new common mer colony. You don't often get the opportunity to watch the formation of a new common mer colony because it usually happens way offshore. And so this is kind of a fun opportunity we ask for one shift per month, but most people wind up going out there nearly every week because they kind of get hooked on the activity out there and are anxious to get back out and see what's going on families they've been monitoring. Um, the season runs from April through August, although we started early this year, we started in March for both Gull Rock and Bodega Rock because the common MERS arrived early and we were uh, anxious to see why and what was going on. So um, although that program ends at the end of August, you're certainly welcome to join us on any of the ships during this month and see what it's like. And um, hopefully you'll be interested for joining us next spring. 
Uh, pinniped you can monitoring. Call us. Uh, pinniped monitoring. Um, next slide, please, Alice. Mm -hmm. Is another yeah. citizen science program, and we're contracted with Sonoma Water, who manages the uh, water levels of the, the Jenner Estuary. And this program now runs from March through October. And we do two shifts from um, the Highway 1 Overlook that looks down on the mouth of the Russian River. We do two shifts a month. Um, we have a target day, but you can go out on um, either side. If the target day is a Wednesday, you can do your shift on Tuesday or Thursday. Um, this is a solitary program. Um, you go out with a mentor until you feel comfortable on your own, and then you can sign up for a shift on your own. Uh, the shifts usually run from, it's a four-hour shift, but you can choose your time as long as you start um, after 8.30 and before 11.30 in the morning. Um, Sonoma Water has a responsibility for, um, sometimes what happens is that the stand bar sometimes closes the river. And so the um, water level of the estuary rises and um, the town of Jenner is vulnerable to flooding at that time. So they have responsibility for doing a mechanical breach. So um, they will do a seal count on the day before the breach and their staff will also monitor during the breach. And then um, our program goes out on the day after and um, counts the seals. And um, part of it is to, because we already have a baseline count from our routine counts, um, they can um, uh, determine if, if there's been any problems to the colonies that uh, happened on uh, because of the, the breach. So if you're interested in that, um, we'd certainly like to get you uh, started with a mentor. And um, it's a wonderful place to spend four hours a day. So thank you for your interest in all of our programs. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hollis. So do you guys have any questions for Hollis about uh, CBAR monitoring? Pinniped monitoring and the kite pool education. Yeah, you can directly unmute yourself to ask questions if you want. And if you don't have questions right now, uh, feel free to shoot them to Alice or Justin or Amelia, and they can pass them on to me, or I can put yeah. my email address in the chat for you. Yeah. Thank you, Hollis. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we hand over to Will Watch, Norma. Okay, good morning, everyone. So I, um, as I said earlier, um, the volunteer uh, program, volunteer coordinator uh, for Will Watch, and I've been doing I've been a volunteer with Stewards uh, Seal Watch and Whale Watch for over 30 years, um, and the Whale Watch program, which I've been involved with most longest, was started by B. Brun back in 1986. It was the second program. Uh, Seal Watch was the first program of Stewards, and I'm ably assisted by. Um, by the Draffins, Rich and Colleen, and Jeff Goldman, and Richard Ships. We are at Bodega Head, uh, the westernmost parking lot, on weekends from January to May, from 10 in the morning to 2 in the afternoon. Of course, you're welcome to come earlier and stay later, and it's all dependent upon the weather. We had a, a lot of challenges this year with an incredible number of days uh, we had to cancel because of winds at 25, 30 mile an hour and more. Um, we are, uh, we wear vests, as you can see uh, someone in the picture on the lower right. Uh, it says whale watch on the back. And one of the great ways to uh, interpret with people is to say, well, you know, we call it whale watch, but but we don't promise that you'll whale see. You may or may not see the whales, but we're there to help people see the whales as they come by on their southbound migration uh, at the early part of the season and then their northbound migration later in the year. 
when they're a little bit closer. And then finally the mothers and the calves, which are extremely close into shore. Um, as I said, the, the time period is 10, 10 to two on the weekends and um, from January to May. And we also have a table that we've set up, which uh, is sort of uh, visible in the upper right uh, photo here where we have whale bones and whale lice and baleen and uh, close-up photos. And we also have a, a, um, uh, a poster of all of the marine mammals of the uh, Eastern North Pacific, uh, which is visible in the bottom left photo. So um, the, we have people who are stationed at the table to interact with folks with the artifacts that we have at the table and then up on the overlook as you can see from the other slide helping people to actually see the whales as they blow and um, come by on their migration. So I think that's all I'm going to say. Uh, happy to have, we have a lot of um, volunteers who have been doing it for many many years so we have a, um, a volunteer training specifically for whale watch, usually in November. But if you cannot make it, um, we uh, and invite you to come out and buddy up with one of the veterans. And even if you do the specific whale watch training, uh, it's always good to buddy up with one of the veterans of which we have quite a number who've been there, um, you know, 10, 12, 15, 20 years. So, um, it's, a, it's a great program and it's a fun way to also interact with a lot of people from all over the world as well as all over the state of California and the Bay Area, some of whom don't even know that we're there or that there's whales going by when they show up uh, at the parking lot. So it's, it's really fun to engage and interact with people. That's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I hope to Thank see you, Norma. You. Hope to see you at the head. So thank you, Norma. So does anyone have any questions for Norma? Okay, and uh, then, uh, oh, it's Seal Watch. And uh, next, our program is uh, Seal Watch. We have uh, Greg Armstrong. Hey, everybody, again. Um, so I'm Greg and I've been doing Seal Watch uh, for eight years, and at some point, I don't remember how and when I was roped in as the uh, uh, point person, but um, I actually started doing SEAL Watch after a divorce, and I thought it was a great thing to do for my son and I, and uh, it was, and he uh, got older and moved on, and I stayed, and um, if you don't know this, it's actually the first program that uh, the stewards had. As a matter of fact, it's the reason why we have the stewards because as the program matured, uh, I got organized and it became an organization with the uh, something of Slovakia. That was the original name anyway, um, but it is the original program. And it was started by a woman who lives right across, who lived right across the river, Eleanor Tui, um, who monitored on her own time, make sure the dogs didn't uh, bother the, the mammals. Um, so eventually I'm glad that it matured to what it is because um, it's, it's a very rich colony. It's a thriving colony and that's why we're there. Um, we've mentioned about whales and you know, uh, tide pools and basically pointing to the amazing uh, coast that we have in Northern California. People don't realize that we're one of five regions, only regions in the, in the world that have these amazing conditions for uh, marine life. And if I've been reading correctly, the last two years actually have been some of the best waters that the Northern California coast has had um, in terms of uh, good conditions for our, our mammals. The water is the coldest it's been in 10 years. Um, you don't know this, the Northern California coast has the vent which makes it unique called the upwelling, which is cold water from the deep ocean comes up and it's very rich. 
and it uh, yields a lot of great food for our seals and our whales and um, anybody who enjoys the sardines and the mackerel that come up with cold water. Anyway, so um, the program consists, like many of our the programs, on shifts. Um, we have two shifts, a morning shift from 10 to 2 and one from 2 to 6. Um, the shifts consist, basically, we are docents and stewards. We are not enforcers. Like some of the other programs, we do wear a vest that indicates that we're there as a volunteers. It says volunteer and that we're there to help. The vests don't say it, but I think that our, we, what we do as docents uh, promotes that. And as the state parks officer, peace officer had said, you know, there's a certain way that we communicate as docents during our shifts um, with visitors. And mostly it's like he said, it's an introduction and ask them if you can be of help. Oftentimes people, when they see the vest, will actually ask you about what's going on there. Um, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity just because you get people from all over the world. I mean, literally from all over the world come to this remarkable spot and are always in awe of seeing this colony uh, of seals. Um, um, the, the shift consists basically the morning shifts or the afternoon. You get there, we have a lockbox down at the beach um, that we open. That's where our equipment is. We uh, pick up some binoculars, some folders, a backpack with radios and photos and brochures, and we place ourselves, as you see at the bottom right hand corner uh, and the top uh, left uh, right hand corner in that spot, not, not the North Beach as you see, but anyway, right there at the mouth of the Russian River. And we spend four hours, uh, well, I do at least four hours in bliss, just watching this amazing uh, show that is called the, North Cal the, the Northern California Coast. And just as an, as an aside, um, Norma had mentioned whales. In the eight years I've been there, I have seen whales as close as I think I'll ever see them. They come up very close to the coast because it's very, very deep. And I even had the opportunity to see a very rare, rare humpback uh, whale sighting, really probably as close as I'll ever get to a humpback whale. Um, it all happens there. I mean, the mouth of the Russian rivers and estuary is super, super rich in food. Um, that's why the seals are there. It's kind of like a buffet. You know, they come out and they sit at the tables being where they are, right where you see the pictures and they go out to the ocean or right there and get their food and come back. It's a perfect way to, perfect place for them to, uh, have their pups and uh, rest. Although, just as an aside, a science fact, they're really not resting, they're oxygenating uh, because they're divers. They actually have an amazing metabolisms, they, which they manipulate uh, by reducing and adding oxygen as they fish. But anyway, those things you would learn if you become a volunteer with Seal Watch. Uh, so again, the shift continues and you're just there with the binoculars until uh, and just wait for questions or you volunteer your services. Um, also, a little bit back to the peace officer, we do have a radio, which this year it's giving us a, a, a fairly hard time. But anyway, I use the radio as a means to let visitors know that I have a means to communicate with someone. And that actually is kind of like a badge of authority. It helps me to um, diffuse and it really rarely happens, visitors that refuse to stay within the lines or, you know, people who are maybe a little bit inebriated and feel a little bit more encouraged to be challenging. Anyway, um, but that's what our radio is for. Uh, I wear it outside along with my vest to let people know that, um, not that I have authority, but I can do something about um, more than they can do. Um, so continuing the shift, um, we, the, the morning shift waits till this afternoon shift if there is one and we exchange pleasantries and we move on. Um, but um, it's basically, as I said, being an educator to visitors. As a, um, and there's a lot to tell. And if uh, we have a manual that we, we have put together that educates you as a volunteer, the basics of the program. Um, let's see. Um, so I think that's all. Oh, our program runs from March to September, and um, we encourage, like Whale Watch, one shift a month. 
um, which actually state parks rewards us for doing just the very minimum of one shift a month, you get an actual park pass for the Mendocino, Sonoma County coast uh, parks. And I know it doesn't, they may not sound like much, but trust me, I've been doing for this for eight years and it really does come in handy when you're just taking a drive up or down the coast. You can just go into Salt Point, go anywhere and don't have to pay and enjoy that beauty. Um, I think that covers all that we do. Um, if you have any questions, I guess we'll put it out for questions at some point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Greg. So uh, Heather, do you want to share your seal watch experience or do you want to? Yeah, I would, I would love to. I'm, okay. um, just, I'm new to the program and I started, uh, I think I'm going into maybe my second month now and I'm pretty much signed up for most Sundays from 10 to two. Um, we desperately need folks. There are a lot of shifts that don't have any coverage and those tend to be Saturdays. Um, I can't speak highly enough about the SEALs. I'm completely smitten. I look forward to my time at, the, at Jenner through my work week. It's the highlight of my week. I spend um, Sundays, most Sundays from 10 to two there. And, and like Greg said, you meet people from all over the world and people are just so enthusiastic about the SEALs. It is the best way, in my opinion, to spend uh, an afternoon, a weekend afternoon. We have uh, a volunteer, uh, two volunteers, mother and daughter, who come up from the South Bay once a month, and that's their mother and daughter time. They they bring chairs and they they spend that time together and engaging um, the public, and I just think that's just fantastic. So, if you if you live far away, it's a great afternoon, a great day. Um, once a month to sign up and sit, you know, bring your chair and sit at the at the mouth of the river. You can, um, I walk up to people, I introduce myself, I make myself available to answer any questions. And, and for those of you who think, well, I haven't had a science class since high school or college, and I have no idea what anyone's talking about, that's okay. You don't have to be a scientist. Um, the materials are there. It's just really your enthusiasm that's needed and it's a learning curve for everybody. Um, so I wanted to offer my services. If you are interested in joining Steel Watch, but you're not quite sure if it's for you, please, I'll put my email address and my phone number in the chat. Feel free to pick up the phone and give me a call and I'm happy to answer your questions. I'm also happy to have you join me on one of my ships and you can kind of buddy up with me almost like a ride along and see if it's something that you want to do before you, you know, jump in and do all the paperwork and commit. Um, I'm happy to, to um, you know, also come out to your first shift if you would like somebody to buddy up with you because you're not quite sure how that first shift is going to go or or um, what what you need to set up. I'm happy to to, to help you out. We are you know, in desperate need of volunteers. There are days when there's nobody there. Um, so if you live in Jenner, there's a few people, John, Ellen, Mark, you guys all mentioned how much you love Jenner. You're on my radar now. I expect to hear some, some calls from you. Yep, yep, <laughs> you will. And I'm happy to help you out. I'm happy to meet you one day and we can figure it out together. Great. Thank you, Heather. So does anyone have any questions about Sail Watch for Heather and Greg? I'm sure there are uh, uh, fact sheets and talking points to memorize <laughs> <laughs> about the SEALs to, anticipate, to be able to answer questions. Uh, there's a binder that has so much great info. Oh, okay, okay. And there's there we have these little um car, like a pamp a flyers that you can hand out to people as well. You're not on your own. There's a lot of great info. Um, yeah, and and 
There are binoculars that you can share with people, and there's a scope uh, that can help you set up as well. And I'll tell you the difference between people just coming up and viewing the seals and then um, those same people with the binoculars, like it's an entirely different experience. They can see the seals up close. Mm -hmm. uh, people cheer, you know, they, they giggle over the pups inchworming across the, sea, the, the, the sand. Um, it's really just so, for me, it's therapeutic. And I love my interactions. You know, for the most part, 99 people are wonderful. There might be one odd character, but, you know, that's life. Um, but it's just so contagious. People just love those seals. Um, I get, you know, so weird. I, I'm there because I want to support the program and I want to support the seals. I'm starting to recognize seals week to week. <laughs> So I'm starting to feel like, you know, I've got some maternal instincts for the seals, but people actually, at, you know, they'll say, thank you for your service. Thank you for volunteering more often than not. And I'm always shocked by that. Um, but yeah, people just are so appreciative that you're there and they don't expect you to be an expert. You know, they'll ask you questions and it's okay to say, I don't know. Let me go see if the, the binder has some info and it's really just sharing your love for these, for Jenner, for the coast and for the yeah. seals. And, and then as you, as you start answering the same questions over and over, you start increasing your knowledge. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Greg will say there's actual, uh, there's a training, a very, very uh, in-depth training uh, for, for seal watch and for marine mammals in general uh, that uh, Dr. Sarah Allen gives. Yeah, that's correct. If you do choose to sign up and do Seal Watch, we bring uh, one of Cal Northern California's premier um, marine biologists who has year after year graciously given a presentation on the Northern California mammal uh, environments. Um, we also have, as I said um, in my presentation, we have a uh, manual that uh, we have available to volunteers which answers the basic questions that you're going to get asked uh, when you're out on the beach, which generally tend to be, you know, how many are out there, how many pups, what do they eat, um, things like that. All those questions are answered in our manual that we have available on the website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Greg. Okay, then uh, next, uh, it's about the... Let me see. We will talk about the trail crew. So here we go. So I'm going to hand over to Tim. Thank you. I'm Tim. I've been with the trail crew for about 15 years. I'm not the coordinator. Uh, the coordinator is Rich Lawton, but he is recovering from surgery right now. And so myself and two others took over the duties of uh, organizing the work days and uh, supervising the crews. So that's why I'm here today. But I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about what it is we do. I personally have found it very rewarding work and uh, it might be something you wanna try yourself. The trail crew is open to everyone. We don't require any particular expertise or, or training. Uh, normally we work with simple hand tools and uh, training is, is uh, easy. Uh, we do work with power tools sometimes. We work with chainsaws, weed whips, and high weed mowers, things like that. Uh, but no one has to use power equipment if they're not comfortable with it. And if they do want to, then we provide the training. Uh, we uh, normally meet uh, on Wednesdays. We work every Wednesday. And uh, we send out a, an email to our volunteers right before the workday so that they know where we're going to work and what we're going to do. And then they RSVP uh, if, they're, if they're going to come so we have some idea of how many people will show up. We ask people to bring their lunch and, uh, and water to drink. And uh, we work at from nine o'clock in the morning and we break for lunch at noon. And then after lunch, we work again till about two o'clock. 
So where do we work? We work in uh, Armstrong Grove, uh, as you saw on the previous slide. Uh, our main, uh, don't go so fast with the slides, please. We, the, our main uh, work with uh, in Armstrong is uh, repairing the, uh, the split rail fences and clearing trails. And uh, also, uh, as you can see in this slide, we, uh, we put up sign, uh, signs and things like that. We repair things that get damaged. And generally, any type of maintenance work that needs to be done. Next slide. We also work in Austin Creek. Uh, and, and there, uh, as you know, the fire did a lot of damage in Austin Creek, especially in the uh, uh, campground. And so a lot of trees had to be removed, a lot of brush had to be cut and hauled out. And here you can see the crew burning some of that brush in our, in, uh, in our burn pile. Uh, we do that weather permitting, of course, they don't do it right at this time of year. Uh, but as one of the main chores up there now is clearing out dead trees and, and brush and reducing the, the fuel load up there. We also work at the Sonoma Coast. Next slide, please. The Sonoma Coast, um, me, mainly our work is on the Cordum Trail and the Pomo Trail. And usually our work is clearing. So this time of year we'll be uh, cutting grass with the weed whips, as you can see one worker doing here. Others are clearing brush with loppers and uh, you can see hand tools on the side of the trail there to do uh, minor trail repairs at the same time. Uh, we also work at Willow Creek, and Willow Creek, uh, it's the same sort of thing. We do trail clearing. Uh, you can see in the next slide, the uh, workers have cleared a uh, cleared the Island of the Sky trail. They're rather happy with themselves, as you can see. But that's <laughs> one of the big projects at uh, Willow Creek. There's a, there's a lot of uh, high grass that needs to be cut this time of year. Um, I'll go on now to talk about some of the tasks in more detail. After uh, rain, we're often doing drainage projects. And uh, fixing erosions. Sometimes you, you can do more uh, substantial projects. If you could forward two more slides. This one? Or the next one. Forward. There's a little bit of a delay. Alice is on our office internet, which is extremely slow. Oh, yeah. Okay, and one more. <laughs> Thanks for your patience, everyone. Mm -hmm. This is the last one. Okay. So I can go back to the previous. Yeah, I've kind of lost track of where you are now. Uh, well, let me just talk then. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's the last slide. Anyway, uh, I, as I was saying, we have to do uh, drainage work sometimes after, uh, after storms. Sometimes there's more substantial work and uh, we might have to resurface a trail. We have a slide showing us uh, doing that on the Cordum Trail near Fur Furlong Gulch where we had to haul in gravel and then compact it on the trail. Uh, one of the more common tasks is uh, clearing the trail of fallen trees, especially in the wintertime at, at Willow Creek and, uh, and also here in Armstrong and, and uh, Austin Creek as well. Often the trees are small and can be handled easily with a pruning saw done by hand. If they're larger trees that we hear about, then we, we pack in chainsaws. And uh, many of our volunteers are trained in uh, the use of chainsaws and they're certified to use them in, in parks. Nobody is required uh, to do that though. And some people uh, love it, some people don't like it at all. Uh, if you're one of those people that don't like it, it's not necessary to use a chainsaw. 
there's always plenty of hand work to be done with loppers and, and pruning saws when we're, when we're clearing trails. Uh, a, a very common task this time of year is uh, weed whipping. Um, you saw the island of the sky that had to be cleared. Uh, uh, the same is true of the Cordum Trail and uh, also parts of the Pomo Trail have a lot of grass that need to be cut and brush. Some, there are parts of the Pomo Trail that would totally be inaccessible, uh, in, impassable if we didn't do our yearly cleaning. And in some places they, they have to be cleared twice a year. Another common uh, task we might do at Austin Creek would be uh, splitting firewood. As I mentioned before, there's a lot of uh, fire damage in the campground. A lot of trees had to be taken down and pulled out. We cut them up into short lengths and we, we split them uh, for firewood. And the firewood then is sold at the campground at, uh, at the coast and also at uh, Bullfrog Campground. Um, okay, here's a, here's a uh, common situation in the winter time with a tree falling across the trail and, and a worker cutting it out with a handsaw. As I mentioned, we do most of our work uh, with hand tools. And there'll be a slide coming up pretty soon, soon that shows some of that work. Um, in the, after the winter, especially in the, in the early spring, we'll be out at the coast on the uh, beach trails. Oftentimes uh, the uh, steps have become covered with sediment or, and the brush has grown thickly. And so we'll, we'll clean those out. Okay, so uh, to sum up, uh, we would really love to see uh, you join us on the, on the trail crew. There's no long-term commitment. We work every Wednesday, but we don't expect people to come every Wednesday. People come when they feel like it. All they have to do is RSVP to the uh, email that we send out and we'll know they're coming. But uh, I, I can guarantee you will find it to be rewarding work when we, uh, we work on the trails, especially when we're doing our trail clearing. All the hikers that, that we meet, invariably they'll, they'll stop and tell us how much they appreciate what we've done. They really notice what we've done. And so here we are out working in the outdoors in a beautiful park and doing work with our hands, which we love, and making the park a better place. So as I say, that is quite rewarding. All the, all the workers have found it to be so. So I... Uh, if you have questions that you think of later, I'll, I'll put my contact information in the chat room and you can email me, but I'll take any other questions you have right now. Go to the last slide, Alice. Yeah, this is the last slide of the trail crew. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tim. And I, I just want to share, um, the trail crew is amazing. Um, there's about 10 to 15 people that show up on a pretty regular basis on the Wednesdays. Um, there is, this is the volunteer trail crew. There is uh, two trail crew staff positions at California State Parks. And so our 10 to 15 um, volunteer uh, member volunteer trail crew does an incredible amount of work that complements the work of the state trail crew. We, we work together and share priorities with them. Um, and in addition to the regular Wednesdays, there's also different groups uh, that come in for special sort of a trail crew volunteer opportunities. And we also welcome folks. Um, a couple members of the trail crew will regularly come in on the weekends and we call them Scotty's helpers. Scotty is our operations manager at the park. There's always lots of work to do. And if you're interested in um, coming in to do some trail work on a day that's not Wednesday, uh, we welcome and invite that as well. For, for example, in uh, August, we're gonna be partnering with the Santa Rosa Junior College 
and doing a special trail crew work day with them, with members of our own trail crew. Thank you so much, Jen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Justin. And the next, we have our stewardship, a marine education van. So I'm going to hand, hand it over to Justin. Thank you, Alice. Um, yeah, so we have our, our stewardship is something that we will typically bring to various events. Um, we would like to bring it to places along the coast. Um, it's designed as a mobile marine education van um, that has interpretive displays and materials inside of it. Uh, with COVID, we've pretty much stopped bringing people inside of the van. And from here forward, are generally using it to tote around the tide pool touch table. Um, it, it's not something that people need to be able to drive. In the past, we had volunteers driving the van. Um, we're just having staff drive it now. But if you're interested in getting involved in various events, um, we bring it out for tide pooling and we'll bring it out to special events as well. Thank you, Justin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Next slide's about the pump farm. Yeah, so pond farm is uh, a really incredible cultural site that we have up in Austin Creek. Uh, it's about a quarter mile up the road from the picnic area in the back of Armstrong Redwoods. Um, it is the site where there was a, a post-World War II um, uh, artists uh, came from, uh, that were part of the uh, Jewish diaspora during the, during the Margaret war. Margaret Wildenheim. Yep, <laughs> there you go, Margaret Wildenheim. Um, settled up there, they had a period where there were artist workshops. Um, with various arts, and then it was taken over by, by Marguerite, um, and she trained a generation of, generation of potters, uh, elevated the importance of studio pottery in the U.S., really brought in the, the form and the function, um, and held summer workshops, summer sessions for potters for about uh, 40 years. It's uh, on the National Historic Register, it's soon to become a National Historic Landmark. Uh, it's a place where we have an artist in residence program uh, where artists will apply to the program um, and stay for a month and focus on their art. Uh, we also do docent-led tours there on a regular basis. If you look on our website, we have um, one posted for August and one posted for September. Um, and docents, you know, immerse themselves in the, the history and legacy of Marguerite um, and share that with the public during these docent-led tours. And it's a, it's a lot of information to get up to speed on, um, but we do have a few upcoming tours if people want to join and shadow and or learn more. Um, please feel free to contact me and we'd love to get you set up with the with Natalie and Charlotte, who are the main docents at the moment. Um, there was just a, a recent article in the uh, Mercury News um, about Marguerite and Pond Pharma. I think I'll, I'll share a link to um, a copy of that since it has a firewall in the chat. But yeah, Pond Farm is a, it's a really special site, but you also come up and visit during one of the tours. And if you're interested in being uh, involved as a docent, we'd love to have you. Yeah, thank you. And next slide is about our special events. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Alice. So we we host a number of special events throughout the year. The um, the biggest one typically annually, annually was our Old Grove Festival, which has been postponed for this year. Um, Carol mentioned uh, being excited about coming out and joining us for unique volunteer opportunities. Um, Heather was at Fish Fest in Bodega Bay earlier this year. Uh, and coming up in August, uh, we're gonna be having uh, a big group of volunteers at the Bodega Seafood Art and Wine Festival. Um, Stewards is having a booth there and we're also recruiting people to help pour beer and wine 
Um, special events is, is one way that stewards gets some additional revenue from retail sales. It's also really great opportunity for us to interact with the public and um, Hollis mentioned, you know, she talked about the tide pool touch table a little bit. Um, that tide pool touch table will be at the Bodega Seafood Art and Wine Festival, which is at the end of August in the, the town of Bodega, not the bay. Um, but if anyone is interested in joining special events like this, um, we'd love to have you. Feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call and I can get you linked up with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. And next slide is about the volunteer recognition. So we have some awards for volunteers and uh, usually we have a uh, dinner uh, each uh, December, the first um, Friday in each December. So we have three types of uh, volunteer awards. The first type is we give award to new volunteers if they have uh, uh, contributed a lot. And the second type is that if they work for more than five years, and uh, we have uh, another award for that. And the third award is uh, for uh, excellent volunteers who has uh, worked for many years and contributed a lot of time and efforts on their program positions. So these are recognitions. And uh, then uh, I think it's time to turn to Amelia to talk about all of the paperwork and uh, how to get into the better impact. Thank you, Alice. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, could you give me the ability to share my screen? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can everybody see that? Yep. Um, so here from the stewardscr.org website, you can go to the volunteer tab at the top. If you just hover over it, it'll bring up a drop down menu. And this first one, volunteer opportunities, is the one I'm gonna click. And if you scroll down a little bit, there's this bold, new volunteer onboarding packet that Justin put together. It's very, very helpful. Click on that. Um, and this first page is just a one page list of all of the steps for onboarding. Um, the first step is to sign up for the newsletter. You'll stay in the loop with all stewards happenings. Um, and then contact us and have a phone call. Just let us know what your interests are. Uh, just a little conversation. And then there's paperwork, which is also included in this onboarding packet. So if you scroll down past this first page, you'll see the volunteer application. This form is, um, it'll autofill the rest of the packet. That's what this is for. So if you just type in your name and address and contact, this will autofill the rest of this packet. And um, the first, the most important form in the paperwork is the volunteer service agreement. Um, here is the agreement outlined for you. Once you're signed up as a long-term volunteer, you will be covered by the state's workers' comp policy or uh, tort liability should something happen while you're performing your volunteer duty. Um, you just sign down here, put emergency contact info. The back of that form is for me, just skip it. Um, this form is optional, but if you should have a worker's comp claim and you'd like to see a personal physician um, specifically, this is the form you would use to let us know. The essential functions health questionnaire is um, just to check, make sure that you're able to perform the duties we're asking of you. And you just fill out this top applicant information, refer to the duty statements for the essential functions we're asking you to do. Check one of these boxes on the second page. There's a space to write if you need reasonable accommodation and sign the bottom. 
And this form is also optional. It's the visual media consent. If you're okay with us using your photo um, in reports or publications, uh, please sign here, but it's not required. And there's more information about how we would use your photo. And then there's a volunteer COVID-19 agreement, um, still in effect at this time. If you could just, it's basically just acknowledging that you're aware that there's a pandemic and how it is spread and that you will follow all protocol around the pandemic. It looks a lot like the volunteer service agreement. I'll just sign the bottom here. And there's also currently a vaccination reporting requirement. So if you could just let me know, there's three different options here. Uh, you can even decline, that's okay. Hi, how are you doing? Um, if you do decline or say that you're not vaccinated, we will ask you to take a test weekly, which we will provide. Um, and my email address is right there. And one of the most important parts of the paperwork is the duty statement. So you have to make sure to include that in the paperwork packet. If you go back up to that first page, there's a link here, complete a duty statement for the program you wish to volunteer for. If you just click that where it says volunteer forms, it'll take you to a link on the stewards website. And if you scroll down, all of the program's duty statements are available here. So you could just click on one to include with your packet. Um, and then you can either email the paperwork to me or send it by mail. Um, it's also okay to bring it to the Armstrong office in person if that works best for you. You're already attending the orientation, so check. <laughs> um, and then there's program specific training to learn more about the program you're interested in. Um, the next step will be to sign up on the volunteer portal, which I'm going to walk you through. But there's also a couple more things here, events and programs on the website and volunteer resources on the website that are all available to you with these links. If you click this link where it says register on the volunteer portal, also known as Better Impact, that's the name of the software company we use. Um, it'll take you to a page that looks like this to get onto the stewards account. And um, if you haven't used this Better Impact software before, it, it'll be necessary to create, a, create an account, create a profile. So I'm just gonna quickly walk you through just a few of the steps on how to do this. Um, just create a username that's unique. The database is uh, how California State Parks keeps track of volunteer time statewide. <coughs> And then headquarters will pull reports from the database, usually in early December to order passes that are earned based on volunteer time. Uh, there's a little checkbox right here to see that what you're agreeing to. Um, just click this little blue agree button. Um, there's also paper paperwork, orientation is necessary, and please maintain a good rapport with all staff. And there's volunteer handbooks for your reference available. That. And then moving through the application, um, the, only the fields marked with flags are required. I'm going to go a little more in depth right now because I noticed that most of you are brand new, but I'll promise to be as quick as possible. <laughs> so you see these little flags. It's uh, just those fields are necessary. Um, but please do enter a phone number. And then your birthday. You have to put the slashes or it won't work. <laughs> English and I'm not a robot. You just have to check that box. Save and continue. And then there's just one more page where you can tell us your availability if you like, tell us what kind of general interests you have, 
Um, this part I'll have to double check anyway, so don't worry too much about it. But if you want to put your primary park that you're interested in and um, whichever program you are seeking, that's a good spot to put that. You can also put if you've had many years of experience volunteering. Emergency contact name is um, required. I'm just going to scroll through here. This part is not required immediately, so you can always go back and fill that in. Um, primary park location. And then you just say, I agree. The information can be found here. Enter this last bit of information and then click submit application. It'll let you know if you skipped anything. Um, and that's it. And then it'll let me know that you signed up on the database and I have to go in and um, approve, you know, set it up for you. I'll check your qualifications and I'll set it all up and then I'll let you know when it's ready. Um, and then I'll show you what it looks like from the other side. You go to www.myvolunteerpage.com. You can log in with the username that you selected. And this is what the volunteer portal looks like. It shows a breakdown of your hours. Um, and if you scroll down, I have three different accounts on mine, but I'm gonna scroll down to the stewards of the Custom Edwards. There's a little photo gallery. Um, in the new section, you'll see a link to the required EEO training, which is um, another step. It's one of the last steps <laughs> in the onboarding process. Um, it's called Bear in Mind, the Fundamentals of Awareness. And this is an e-learning module, but I could also send a PDF of the workbook or send it in the mail. It's just to, um, you know, raise awareness of diversity in the parks and make sure you're mindful in all your interactions. Also required for employees every two years. Um, and there's an optional training here. But the database, the main thing is to record volunteer time. So there's an hours tab right here at the top. And you just select an activity from the list, enter the date, the amount of time. Some activities require feedback. It was very windy. I interacted with eight people. You can write whatever you like there. Um, and then just push save. Um, and here, if you skipped anything on the initial run through of creating a profile, you can do it over here by selecting my profile. So I think that's about all of that. Does anybody have any questions? It's a it's a somewhat intimidating process with all the uh, the database and uh, the paperwork, but I just want everyone to know that we're here to help you. Um, Alice and Amelia and myself. Um, looks like I'm not sure if Carol's raising her hand to ask a question or if she's also interested in helping out with folks. But uh, we're happy to guide you along the way. I had a question in the chat too about uh, the duty statements um, relative to the volunteer application packet. So the packet itself that's on that page that Amelia showed everyone, that's one of the most important parts once we get that going. We'll make sure to send you reminders and things like that to, to get um, set up and logged into the database. And uh, in the packet, there's a place to insert your duty statements. And right now, um, you might be interested in more than one volunteer opportunity. So you're welcome to uh, you know, try it out, feel it out. Uh, join Heather, join Carol, um, join Greg, uh, join Tim. You know, if if it's something that it seems like you're going to be interested in doing on a regular basis, definitely want to get the duty statement um, approved for that so that uh, everything's squared away. So let us let us know if you have any questions, if you need help along the way. Justin, I was just thinking, you know, even though I've been doing this for 20 plus years, 
there's a lot of information in that application that I don't know. Maybe I should fill out another application. <laughs> I think so. We've been we've been going program by program to get updated paperwork and information from folks, Carol. And I imagine if it's been you know more than ten years, it would be great to have you fill that paperwork out again, just so that we're making sure that you're you're good and set in the system. And I, I just want to share that um, you know, logging your volunteer hours, you can do it on a you know, as you volunteer, you can do it on a monthly basis, but it's really important for us to be able to capture those hours. It's things that is helpful for stewards to apply for funding. It's really important for the state of California um, as those, you know, the number of volunteer hours is something that is considered when they're passing bills and appropriating funding for state parks. So please, as you and, and when you volunteer, log your hours um, and let us, you know, again, let us know if you need help. We're here to here to help support you and help build your confidence in all of this. And um, yeah, just don't hesitate to reach out. Any other questions or I'll hand it back to Alice. Mm -hmm. Sure. Justin, I'll add, it's Heather, real quick, I'll add to that. Um, as a semi-new volunteer, the staff, Amelia, everyone has been extremely helpful and welcoming. So um, don't be shy. Reach out to any of the staff. Reach out to the volunteers. Um, you are so needed, as I think everyone has explained so far. So whatever, you know, I'll, I'll do whatever I can to, to make the process as seamless as possible. So please don't be overwhelmed by the amount of paperwork. It's not so bad. And there's a lot of people, like Justin said, who can, can help. But um, yeah, just don't be shy. Just reach out to anyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Heather. I have a question. So it sounds like uh, the that what one should do is first do all the paperwork and then sign up for shadowing a docent or, or trying something out at the at your different programs. But first the paperwork and and then and then the trying things out until you find your best spot. Is that the process? Best process. I mean, if you're, if you're undecided of on which program you're most interested in and you would like to learn a little more first, I think that's fine to go out and shadow and then, oh, and then make the decision. But don't forget to do the paperwork. Well, <laughs> don't start signing up for No, uh, I, I, I'm, no I'm very, uh, I, I would love to be a volunteer. Okay. Uh, and so I, and I'm happy to do the paperwork first if that's the best way to go about it. Uh, but I, I'm interested in several of your programs, and uh, I, yeah. I thought it might be wise to so shadow Ellen, a couple, people, a couple yeah. of programs before the best I thing, went. The best thing to do is fill out the paperwork, Okay. start shadowing, mm -hmm. and then do your duty statements. So the uh -huh. duty statements okay. are for each program. Okay. So if you're just volunteering for one, you would have one duty statement. If you're volunteering for more than one, one program, you would complete multiple duty statements. Okay. Um, so do the paperwork, except for the duty statements, find out what you like, and then when you know and when you get up and running, fill out those duty statements. Okay. And it helps us get you connected to, um, right now we have various like listservs for different volunteer programs. Mm -hmm. uh, like for Seal Watch, it's... Uh, we reach out at sealwatch at stewardscr.org for trail crew. It's it's a different listserv. So we really just, you know, want to make sure that we're communicating with you and getting that first paperwork packet is the most important part for doing that. And getting it added to those various various communications. Great. Hello, everybody. Uh I had a senior moment that lasted about two hours, so I got involved in a project, and uh, here I am. I, I'm Mike Roa. I work uh, primarily with Armstrong Redwoods uh, uh, tours, but I also do the stewardship and other stuff, so I presume somebody gave a spiel about them, but I'm here if you have questions. Yeah, and Mike, do you want to talk about the upcoming training in August and what people can expect at that? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, again, uh, I primarily work with uh, Armstrong Redwoods. Um, on the 26th, I think it is, of, yeah, 26th of August, I will be doing a training for people who are interested in possibly being um, uh, docents with Armstrong Redwoods. Uh, we'll be doing some walking through the forest, talking about what one can point out or say or do at various places. Uh, we'll give some tips for, um, for being a docent, for interpreting, and uh, give you some uh, actually physical uh, materials to use. So if you're at all interested in possibly being either a, a roving docent at Armstrong Redwoods or leading tours, and tours can either be kids or adults. Um, we certainly need some more docents, so be happy to have you join us on the 26th of August. August 1, is that in the morning? Yes, it'll be from uh, 9 to noon. Uh, we might uh, go a little over, but the plan is for 9 to noon. I want to say thank you, everybody. I have to leave. I have another appointment to go to. But thank you for a nice presentation. Thank Bye -bye. you, Carol. Bye -bye. Bye. Nice meeting you. Goodbye. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, we'll stick around for a few minutes if folks have questions. And yeah. um, we will also paste the link to the onboarding packet in the chat. I'll do that. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for. Oh, you already did. Thank you, Mary. No, I will. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so grateful to have everyone's uh, energy and enthusiasm and interest about our programs to protect the coast and redwoods um, and share these amazing treasures of the world with the public. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a great presentation. I enjoyed yes, it and learned a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, Suzanne here. I have a few questions, if yeah. this is appropriate. Okay. Uh, so my experience is coming from the Santa Clara County Parks volunteer system. Mm -hmm. By the way, the whole stack of paperwork, the log on process looks very similar. So it's very doable. Um, okay. So do volunteers have to pay to park at, I haven't been to Armstrong since before the fires. So do volunteers have to pay to park? That's one question. Um, is first aid, CPR, that sort of thing required before volunteering, uh, training? Um, no. And, oh, for like the, the whale watching, do the volunteers need to pick up the materials and drive it out there? Or is that, that sounds like that is uh, put in the van and staff provides that, is that correct? I can answer the one about first aid. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. We don't, we don't, um, we don't want, okay, I'm not, I'm not wording it correctly. Unless it's in the duty statement, we'd, you wouldn't be, it wouldn't be part of your volunteer duties to perform first aid. But if you did act in some sort of um, hero capacity while you're volunteering, you can as like a good Samaritan, but um, we wouldn't be asking you to perform any of those things unless it was in the duty statement, which it's not in any of our duty statements. Right? Okay, so, so that training is not required. Okay. No. Yeah, not not required, but we're we're looking at op offering a wilderness first responder training um, mm -hmm. to the public and also for volunteers. It's a it's a helpful skill. Um, and then to answer your other questions about parking, mm -hmm. um, while volunteering, we provide a parking pass for folks. So if you're coming in to be a docent and any location, um, parking is covered. Um, and then the materials for Whale Watch, there's a restroom structure out on the head. And in the middle of that restroom structure, um, one of the Whale Watch uh, leads or coordinators will have the key to access those materials. And it's, it's like a, you know, maybe a 25 foot walk from the, the restroom area where they're stored um, to where they get set up at the table on the head. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. Good thank presentation. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, you know, I'll add, you bring up a good point, Justin, too. Whale Watch is really um, highly accessible, so you can pull right into Bodega Head Park, and it's it's really a very short walking distance to the to the point, to the lookout. 
Um, so if there's any mobility concerns, it is really a great program to, to be involved in. Seal Watch, you have to kind of trek across some sand. It's a good walk. Um, so in terms of mobility, Whale Watch is fantastic. It's, it's very simple to, to drive in, park, and, and walk to the site. Um, there was a question in the chat about paperwork. Can it be completed online or do you need a hard copy? Um, ultimately, I do have a hard copy in the filing cabinet at the end of the day, however it gets here, one way or another. Um, and also, I recently got access to DocuSign. So um, if you know which program you're interested in, it can be really quick and easy. Uh, just let me know if you prefer for me to send it via DocuSign. And I can do that if I know which program to include the duty statement for. Do you know, uh, <clears throat> this? I used to be a, a mentor with a program called Be A Mentor Inc. Uh, and uh, that was for inner city youth. Um, and uh, I used to take them out to, to nature and um, to just nature experiences. That was my particular function. And then after COVID, it became um, online and only academic tutoring. So I'm not as involved anymore. And I just wondered if there were any programs available, uh, reach out, are, are, are you reaching out in any way or do you want help with that? Uh, reaching out to inner city youth who you know, are trapped in their environments in many cases uh, and don't have the, the opportunity to get to someplace like Armstrong. Uh, and I, I would also be delighted to help with that if there's something already in place or, or you, if you could direct me to an organization, you know. That's doing yeah. that. I would, I would, do that. I would, I would say on um, one of the best ways for us to do that is through sharing the resources that we have with groups like that. So, okay, um, you know, Mike's uh, Armstrong Redwood Docent Program. Okay. We get a lot of groups from different schools. Um, docents uh, earlier this month uh, participated with the Boys and Girls Club. Um, going to the Greenville School campus and oh, uh -huh. sharing about some of our, you know, programs, doing a bark rubbing and things like that. And then right. uh, okay. just this, this past Friday, they came out and in, into the forest. Um, it's we we do outreach mostly to teachers. Um, we would, you know, very much welcome outreach to other groups and offer them the opportunity to come in for a tour. Um, you know, for for underserved groups generally it's a it's a free tour um, it's run by volunteers oh. and we also offer transportation scholarships of up to a couple hundred bucks for oh. people to be able to get a bus to come to the forest as well <laughs> so we we love doing stuff like that do it all the time and the best way for us to do it is through our our group tour program through a rich program the oh, arms from tour. Tour. Just tour. tour got it okay tour. yeah yeah didn't you used to do something at Pomo Canyon and also with the Willow Creek Watershed Program? But I think mostly Pomo Canyon, you had an outreach program there. We, yeah, we still do a, a handful of work at Pomo and with our watershed program. It's just a little bit less active than our Armstrong Redwood Stocents. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I have a quick question now. Is there any priority as far as the most need for volunteers right now? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, all of them are our priorities. I know, I know. Great. all of them are great. Yeah. yeah. And they're, they're also a little bit seasonal too. Um, but the, the biggest gaps where we need volunteers to fill in are for Seal Watch for our Jenner and Armstrong Visitor Centers, and then for our Arm Armstrong Redwood docents. Oh, those are my top three choices. Oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> you can join all three, Ellen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would think, uh, Justin, correct me if I'm wrong, um, I would think that the Visitor Center need is particularly acute during the summer when we have more visitors, and the Armstrong docents, of course, is uh, we need more during the school year, but we do get some tours during the summer. Correct, yeah. There's seasonality and everything for our program. 
And I'll add, I have to pitch again shamelessly. See you <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> she's good she's good so, <laughs> only another month <laughs> so there are we it's, use the, the most, it's the least accessible program if you have any mobility issues or, or difficulty walking it's a very long hike out to out to the over to where you do it and when you come back you either have to take the equipment out or you have to bring it back and if and if you're lucky and you can hitch a ride with the lifeguard, that's great. But that's not always an option. So, how far is the hike from parking and through sand to the work location? Well, it takes me probably. I don't know. I never even thought about it. I mean, I, I don't have mobility concerns, and I'm I've got a backpack. I've got my mm. beach chair. You know, I, so I'm kind of loaded down a bit, probably five, ten minutes out oh. to, to where the seals are. Well, that's that's you. <laughs> well, that's why I don't do it. I did. That's, that's what shadowing, shadowing is about, right? That's why I don't do it anymore. <laughs> well, I, I did preface it by saying I don't have mobility concerns. Yeah. So if, if there are mobility issues, definitely it might be a challenge. It might take you longer, or it may not be accessible at all. Um, if you're unable to like low carry stuff out, but you'd like to do the walk, then, you know, team up with somebody who might be able to carry. So, you know, it's, but I will say what I wanted to point out was there are four available shifts for each time slot, right? So Saturdays and Sundays, 10 to 2 and 2 to 4 in our in the, the, the program that we use to sign up is called um, Team Up. And there's four slots available for each of those time shifts. Right now, Saturdays are generally um, empty for signups. Um, there's usually one, maybe two people signed up on Sundays. And I'm speaking again, very general. And this is just mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. short experience. And Greg mm -hmm. has much more experience. You can add much more than I can, but just in my very short experience of the last few months, I'm um, often alone on my shift. Um, so there's a real, there's a lot of open shifts <laughs> for seal right. watch right now, if you're able to make the walk across the beach. So um, can you, is it like a, a, a half a mile or a quarter mile? Good. Uh, I know, Greg, how, do you know the distance? No, I think it's about eight minutes, physical distance. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, if the wind is blowing really hard, which comes from the Northwest, it's going to take you 12 minutes. Oh, if there's no okay. wind. You know, it'll take you eight minutes. And, and um, how much do you carry? How much weight do you carry? You know, we leave, we leave that up to you. We technically, if we if you wanted to carry a full pack, we have a tripod. We have two monocles. We have three binoculars. Okay, we that's have not a heavy. Binder, uh, you know, so it, it depends on you. We don't we, we don't require anything. I usually, if if it's a cold day, I'll bring a binocular and a binder and a radio, and that's it. Oh, okay. Um, if I know it's going to be a beautiful day and I know that I expect to have probably over 50 or 60 visitors, yeah, I'd like to have three or four binoculars available um, and, you know, a full suite of promotion, brochures, pictures, you know, the, the, the whole nine yards. Uh -huh. um, and again, if you get to do it with someone else, it used to be when the pro when I first started the program, we was always two up. Um, but if you have someone that's doing, doing it with you, a friend or something, yeah, mm -hmm. um, bring the material. But it really depends a lot on, on the conditions of the beach. The beach changes from week to week, from season to season. Sometimes it's very approachable and hard sand. Sometimes it's really mushy um, and it takes you a while. And then the wind can be, you know, really a challenge sometimes. Right. Uh huh. And then, but, and then once you're out there, uh, are, are you walking around or are you mostly standing still? You can do what you want. I mean, when there's a group of, uh, of visitors, I, I grab oh, yeah, right. towards them. But usually on a quiet day, I mean, I get to enjoy the beach myself. I'll walk uh -huh. everywhere. You know, don't tell anybody, but I have access that people don't. <laughs> so I'll cross the line and get really close and take pictures and uh -huh. really watch the seals close by with uh, binoculars and really get into it. Um, but uh, ultimately, uh, my our focus is the, the visitor. And yeah. so we walk towards the visitor. If not, lie down, sit down. Oh, okay. The jetty yeah. is a great place to hang out, which is 
you know, we're not, it's a dangerous place and state parks prefers that we wouldn't, but um, it's not ro roped off, but it's a gorgeous place to be. You can see the sea lions playing, you can see the actual, yeah. uh, you know, trout going out and s salmon. It's a trippy place. I, I bet. Yeah. Um, I, I have a little bit of a weird back problem that really uh, bothers me the most if I'm just standing still for a long time. I know that one. But I can, but walking, keep, keeping moving is, is fine, you know, as long as I'm moving. And also, I probably shouldn't carry a backpack that weighs maybe more than 50 pounds or something. So it sounds like everything is doable. Yeah. Yeah, it's doable. Absolutely. Yeah. And you have plenty. You can lie down. I mean, really, I mean, if, when it's quiet there, it's your time. Yeah, it sounds fabulous. No, I've, I've spent, I mean, it's, it's a really beautiful place to be. It's just unique. It's an estuary. And just by the nature of being an estuary, it brings yeah. Northern California marine mammal life to its best. Great. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I think it's time to wrap up today's training. Yeah. Thank you guys for attending today. Well, this was wonderful. Our this was just awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, everyone, for Thank joining. Mm -hmm. yes. really good. See you okay, see you soon. Time. See you soon, everybody. Bye bye. See you. Wish bye, you have everybody. a great rest of your weekend. Bye. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Justin. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you okay. very much. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Bye. Justin, you still there? Yeah. yeah. Can I have uh, five minutes? Five minutes. Can I call you on the phone? <laughs> sure. It may right. be, get... be easier on Zoom, but phone is okay. I'm going, a question. I'm going fishing at Shelter Cove. Yeah, I'll I'll call your phone, Mike. I gotta uh, get start driving south. I'm headed okay. to South, but I'll give you a call. Hi, Amelia. Have a nice weekend. Bye.